like you to turn in your Bibles or your apps this morning to John chapter 1. How many of you believe there is a better life beyond this place? Let me ask that again. How many of you believe there's a better life beyond this place? As we continue in our Christmas series, The Light of Men, on this Christmas Sunday, I want to talk to you about the light that gives life. In John's version of the Christmas story, John says the birth of Christ is like the appearance of light piercing darkness. So radically different than Matthew and Luke's version of the Christmas story, which are more narrative and historical in nature. But John, you know, he's radical. John was the oldest living of all the apostles. The Romans tried to boil him in oil. They couldn't kill John, so they banished him to the island of Patmos where Jesus appeared to John and gave him the entire book of Revelation, the book of last things. John comes at this from a completely radically different perspective as he's moved by the Holy Spirit to make a theological statement about the coming of Jesus. He's saying, you know what, it's, it's about light piercing darkness. And John chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 says, In him was life. This is John's statement about the birth. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness cannot comprehend or overcome the light. What are we talking about? We're talking about the supremacy of light over darkness. The supremacy of light being able to defeat darkness in all the forms that it manifests itself in the world that we live in. In the very first act of creation, God said when the earth, if you read back in Genesis chapter 1, when the earth was without form and void. And how many of you know that God never does life without form and void? When the earth was in that state, the first act of creation, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God separated the light from the darkness. And the light was predominant because of the supremacy of light over darkness. When Jesus came to planet earth, on Christmas morning, he came as a light to pierce the darkness of our world in all of its dimensions. So much so that John later on in his gospel says in John chapter 8 verse 12, Jesus speaking now saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. How many of you would prefer light over darkness in your days? In 2016, in the Nicene Creed, which is one of the first statements theologically of the early church, the church confesses Jesus Christ as God of God, light of light. In Jesus, we see God's eternal light from the moment of his birth to the time of his resurrection. The life of Jesus was filled with God's light. Jesus was completely and absolutely transparent with the light of God. And whoever has seen Jesus has seen the Father. Because that's an expression of that light. John says in Jesus was life. Say life. life. That life was the light of men. In other words, he is connecting life and light together. So much so that in the original Greek language, the word for life is the word zoe, which is translated and literally means the God kind of life. When God said, let there be life, God was expressing himself. For the scripture says that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness. John says that later on in his epistle. Jesus came to give us the God kind of life, life at, as the creator knows it in heaven. As we gather here this morning on this Christmas Sunday, Jesus came during Christmas to split history, to take you and I from the place of darkness we live, from the damaged, abused, used, abandoned, run down, broken, 
hopeless, shameful places. We referred to in our video this morning. And he shines the light and it pierces and dispels that darkness. And he always makes a way of escape. How many of you believe that this morning? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the good news of great joy that the angels announced to the shepherds. They said this good news, this great story is for all the people. Nobody is exempt. Nobody in your family is exempt from this good news and this great story. And I know that there are those of you who have come this morning, you're burdened by family members that are still in the darkness, that are still wandering and have gone astray. Sons and daughters and parents and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and relatives that you're burdened by. God said they don't have to stay in that place. You don't have to stay in that place. Because you know what? God has a bigger and he's got a better place in Christ for you and I. You don't have to stay browned. You don't have to stay broken. You don't have to stay bruised. You don't have to be fearful of death and the afterlife. You don't have to live in fear and doubt and hopelessness. You can know today that you're right with God. Heaven is your home. There is life beyond this place. There is life beyond where you are living. It gets better. It gets bigger in God. This is God speaking his word over you and I. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, God said, you're a chosen generation. You are a royal priest and a holy nation, his own special people, that you might proclaim the praises of him. We ought to gather together every Sunday in 2016, every opportunity we have, even though all hell breaks loose every time you decide you're going to come to church, you're going to be a part of the church, or more importantly, you're going to go out and you're going to express what church looks like in your world, every time we ought to come ready to proclaim his praises. Why? Because Peter said, and he understood this firsthand, he has called us out of darkness into his marvelous what? Light. Why? Because God is light. And in him, there's no darkness. So what dark place are you facing today in your life? What dark place is tormenting you? On Christmas morning, there was life in that baby laying in that manger. Not just any kind of life, but the life that emanates from the light of God himself, the creator of the universe. And when it shines upon you and I, it produces, it reproduces itself in us. Life that pierces our personal darkness emotionally. And we talked last Sunday about the dark days of discouragement and distress. The dark days of disappointment and depression. How that that light can pierce those places in our lives. And if you weren't with us, you want to pick up that CD or get online onto our website or Facebook, you can listen to that message and just allow that to speak to your heart so you can set the stage for a new year. We're talking about life that heals our hearts and our bodies when we're facing physical darkness. Life that saves our souls when we're facing spiritual darkness and uncertainty about life after death. Life that creates and makes us new. And isn't it amazing that we see this miracle of life being transformed into light and then back to life in creation through the process of photosynthesis. If it wasn't for the process of photosynthesis, where plants can take that light and transform it into oxygen and consume the carbon that is in the atmosphere. How many of you know that if that process stopped, that we would be living, that the planet Earth would be filled with death and darkness? Where's our scientists here this morning? There's Dr. Charles Rowe. Is he here? Can you confirm that that's true? Right? If we don't get the carbon out and we don't get the oxygen in, you know what? This is a dark, this is a lifeless planet. And we see in creation how the God takes light, transforms it into life. And that process just continues. 
Light gives life. In fact, I want to just highlight for you quickly how that the word light is an acronym for us that speaks to us of how God wants to impart his life to us. Life that is higher, that is more supreme, that is better than anything you and I can experience here on planet Earth. The L stands for this. God wanting to inform us. He wants us to know what he is like. The L is let us know what God is like. Why? Because God wanted a family. And he created you and I in his image and likeness so we can be the objects of his love. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He introduced God to us. The concept was formed in the Old Testament until the coming of Christ, who is the light, the pure, transparent light of the Creator Himself, the Father. He introduced to us the fatherhood of God, he introduced to us the fact that we are His sons and His daughters, a part of His family. Paul speaks of it in the book of Ephesians. He says that the Creator universe is the Father is the father of a family here on earth as well as in heaven. Simultaneously, all of God's sons and daughters who are on planet earth and those who have preceded us who are in heaven, they make up his family. They are objects of his love. And we were created to love him back and to worship him. And when God came into the world 2,000 years ago, of all the ways he could have chosen, he came as a baby. He came into the world the same way Every one of us comes into the world by being born into it. you got to ask the question, why did he do that? He could have come 10,000 different ways. Why would he come as a baby? I think it's real simple. Because he wanted to save us and not to scare us and not to intimidate us. So many different ways God could have come that would have frightened us as human beings, as people. He came as a baby first because he wanted to identify with us, and second because he came to save us, not to scare us. That's the I in light because the Creator wanted to inform us of his great plan. Of course, we look to John chapter 3, which is such a powerful passage that speaks to us of God informing us of the great plan he has for us as his sons and daughters. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. But we neglect verse 17, which is so powerful. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, to scare the world, but that through him the world might be saved. See, God doesn't do fear. God doesn't do intimidation. And the great news of this story is God is not mad at you and I. He's not mad at all those estranged sons and daughters in your family that are living in the darkness. On the contrary, God sent his son to continue to draw them back, and that drawing process continues 24-7. God is drawing us back to himself. Why? Because you know what? History is God's love story. You've heard me share it. You know what? It's got four acts. Act one, God makes us objects of his love because he wanted to have a family. He wanted to love us and he wanted us to love him back. Act two, we wander away from his love. Paradise gained in the book of Genesis. Paradise lost. One chapter later. Act three, God draws us back to his love. How does he do that? He does that through Christmas. That's the launching pad, right? God sends his son. He plants that first fruit seed so that you and I might have the potential to be brought back into relationship with him. The scripture says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Not talking about a physical death. He's talking about spiritual death, which literally means separation from God. We were all separated because we were born in sin. David said, when I was in my mother's womb, I was in sin, separated. It's transferred because Adam and Eve were the representatives of the human race. So in birth, that original sin is transferred. We're separated. We're alienated from God. God said, I'm going I'm to fix that. I'm going to take care of that. He planted his son who was born to die. And when Jesus hung on the cross and said, it is 
finished. The process was completed, and it leads us to Act 4. We've got to choose to accept or to reject that love. And this is the thing that just absolutely blows my mind, and we talk about this in our studies. You know, I've got a men's Bible study I've done for 19 years now. Every Friday morning at 6 o'clock, we've got a group of guys together, and we just can't get our arms around the fact that God is such a profound respecter of the human will. How many of you know that God will not violate your will to choose? God spoke through Moses and said, I set before you life and death. He said, you choose. You choose. I'm not going to force it upon you. You've been created in my image and likeness. You choose. That's act four. We are living act four today. Some of you are here today, and God knew when you were in your mother's womb that you'd be here and that he would be making you an offer. This whole service is an offer that God's making to you and I. It's act four. He's offering his love to us, and he's giving us a, the opportunity to choose. In John chapter 1, John said, For as many as received him, say received, he gave them the right and the power and the privilege to become God's sons and daughters. You and I do not have the right power or privilege. If you read John's gospel later in chapter 1, he said you have the right power and privilege because you've received him. That's a choice. That's a decision. And if you don't make that choice and decision, you don't have the right power and privilege to become a part of the family and to get back into right relationship with him. So the implication is simple. There is no such thing as universal salvation. Amen? Just because Jesus died on the cross doesn't mean automatically everybody is saved. You've got to receive it. You have to believe it and allow God to guide you in a relationship because you know what this is not about rules rituals and regulations I spent the first 18 years of my life believing it was about the lighting of the candles about putting the time in and going through the motions with the rules the re regulations and the rituals you know if you just did enough of that and you were just good enough you would you'd be able to get God's attention and earn your salvation somehow the end, when you stand before God, that the good will outweigh the bad. And I'm here to tell you that the good never outweighs the bad. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, Paul said, is eternal life. It's a gift. You can't buy it. You and I cannot bargain for it. God says, I'm setting it before you. No strings attached. Why? Because you are my sons. You are my daughters. I'm calling you back. And I'm going to guide your steps. That's the G. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't stumble through darkness, for living light will flood your path. Why? Because light, by its very nature, it illuminates. Amen? Some of you are confused today. Some of you got some big decisions to make. You can't get clarity. So what happens in our journey, and maybe you've done this in 2015, we pull out our own flashlights, don't we? And how many of you know that we've got very dim flashlights? Sure, we pull out the, the, the financial flashlight and we say, you know, I'm going to fix that, that debt problem. And you know what happens? We go further into debt. You know, I'm going to pull out the family flashlight. And you know what? We escalate the conflict. All right, I'm going to pull out the, you know, the work flashlight. You know, and we're in greater conflict a year later than when we started. Because you know what? God has got a much bigger light that brings much greater clarity and direction than anything you and I could experience in our lives, our career, our finances, our future. We mess things up when we pull our own flashlights out. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 3, if we trust the Lord with all of our hearts, that's a choice, amen? We lean not to our own understanding. We acknowledge him in all of our ways, which means, God, I'm inviting you to come in to be a part of my life, to guide me and direct me and to shine that light. He said, God's promise is that he would make your path straight. 
and my path straight. He would take us exactly where we need to go, when we need to go, in a way that we are blessed and our lives are filled with, with increase and blessings. So what are you confused about today? What do you need God to give you clarity for? Because he wants to do that for you today. The H stands for, for the healing process that comes when he shines the light and we get that clarity. God heals our hurts when that light shines and that life, God's life starts touching us. You know what happens? Healing begins to take place in our lives. Jesus came at Christmas to heal our hurts. Amen? This is so big. I've talked to so many people personally and discovered one thing that everybody has a hidden wound somewhere. Everybody has a place that they're hurting that's hidden from somebody else at some level. Here's the good news. No matter where you are hurting, Jesus can heal the hurt, the resentments, the worry, the guilt, the fear, the bitterness, even the boredom that maybe you're experiencing. Christ can heal it. Christ is able to do it because he's the light of the world. So much so that doctors have discovered that there is healing power in light. It promotes healing. Some of you have taken the glasses off. You've gotten laser surgery. Why? Because lasers are a light, aren't they? Used to do what? To heal and to correct vision. Fix your eyes with light. Heal your body. Promote healing physically. But only God, church, can heal a broken heart. Only God can heal a broken spirit. Only God can heal a broken heart relationship a broken dream he says come to me because i can heal your hurts and i can even heal your physical body so much so that david said in psalms 103 when he's blessing and recounting god's blessings in his life he says bless the lord oh my soul talking to himself your self-talk in 2016 is going to make or break you he's having a conversation with himself which, by the way, all of the books of the Bible and Scripture are God's word to you and I, except for the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is man's word to God. David's speaking to God. He's saying, God, I'm blessing you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And he recounts, he says, who forgives us of our sins and iniquities, who heals us of our sicknesses and diseases. Going to be doing the funeral for one of our founding members. Helped us launch Word of Grace back in 1997, the spring of 97. Linda Crenidi. Linda Crenidi and Joe Crenidi were part of our founding team. I'll be doing that service on Monday morning. I know many of you will come and join us uh, this afternoon and, and on Monday morning. On July 6th of 1992, Linda was supposed to have a heart and lung transplant, both lungs. God touched her and did a miracle so that she didn't need to have her heart transplanted, but she did need a lung transplant. And when you have a lung transplant, what typically happens is when a new lung is put into the human body, the second lung will shrivel up. And the new lung will become predominant, will become the predominant source, respiratory speaking. When she received her new lung, the second lung came back to life and became the predominant lung, and the new lung became the secondary lung. They never, ever, ever, ever saw that in the history of medicine. She was the longest living lung transplant patient in the history of the United States of America. 24 years. And we thank God for... God, God touched her body. God gave her 24 additional years. They did not expect her to live through the surgery. Why? Because you know what, church? God's, God's a healer. You know, God wants to touch us in mind and body and spirit. 
you know, in every dimension of our lives. You know, we can't script that. We don't know how that always works. But you know what? There's, there's a, the hope that God sets out before us. And we hold on to that, which brings us to the T of, of light. And that's our last focus this morning, is that he transforms ultimately our lives when that light and that life begins to be imparted to us. It affects us in every dimension. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy but I've come in contrast to his work to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. And we're going to be talking about three dimensions of how this life affects us as human beings and how transformational it can be on Christmas Eve for the Christmas Eve service. You don't want to miss it. This is going to be really powerful. But it's the same Greek word he uses in the 10th chapter of his gospel as he used in chapter 1 and verse 4, the text of our series. The God kind of life, Zoe, I've come to give it to you. Not in small measures, not portioned out. He said, I come to give it to you abundantly, overflowing. I want your cup, God said, to be overflowing. You're not a Christ follower. You don't know what it means to have God pour into your empty vessels, your empty heart, the empty places in your life, in your relationships. When God pours in, God told David, I'm not going to just fill it up. Psalms 23, David said, he makes my cup to run over. It's not half full. It's not filled to the brim. He said, it is running over. Why? Because he is the God who is more than enough. God has more than enough resources for you in 2016. God has more than enough love. He's got more than enough power. He's got more than enough strength. He's got more than enough mercy, grace. Whatever you need, God has already seen ahead and made provision through Christ. Some of you aren't sure you're going to make it to next week. You're not sure you're going to make it in this year. And God said, you know what? Don't worry about that. I've got it taken care of. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. What things? All the things we worry about. How are we going to make it? God said, I got that taken care of. I got that covered. Why are you worrying about it? When the light of his life shines upon your life, it becomes transformational. That's why Paul could say confidently in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if any man or woman is in Christ, old things have passed away, but behold, all things have become new. God wants to do something new in you today, in this coming year. It's a life that affects us in the here and now and the there and the after. In the here and now because he wants to bless and to increase our lives, to make us bigger and better, to take us farther and higher. Perhaps this past year has been a year filled with some darkness for you. If you're honest this morning, some of you, not all of you, but some of you may have lost a job or were laid off. Perhaps you had to go into bankruptcy or had a financial crisis, a relational crisis with your husband, your wife, your children, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. Maybe you went through a divorce or had the death of a loved one. How ironic that we've got a whole series of funerals happening this week. Simultaneously, simultaneously we are dealing with life and death. What a paradox. The paradox of life, isn't it? It's how close we are to eternity. Somebody once said, it's, you know what, just simply a heartbeat away. We have no guarantees. A lot of different things may have come your way, and you feel like you are stuck in that place that was referred to earlier in our video. Maybe you're looking forward with hope that 2016 will be a time where you can move forward in a new year, and I'm here to tell you the light of Christ coming at Christmas offers you life. Wherever darkness has brought death in your journey this year or in years past. A life beyond this place. That's what Christmas is about. It's about God offering to you and I a better life, a better hope, a better future, a life beyond where we are today. 
if we'll trust him, if we'll allow him to take us there. Why? Because it's not just about the here and the now, but it's about the there and the after. That's act four. God's saying, you know what? I'm setting before you life and death. I'm making an offer of love to you. Because that life can change your past, present, and your future, but you got to make a choice to say yes to him. That's faith, because when we come to the end of our lives, God's going to ask us two questions. Number one, what did you do with my son? And number two, what did you do with I entrusted to you? The first question will determine where you spend eternity. It's in the scripture. Read it. Second question will determine how God rewards you in eternity. See, we get it reversed and confused. We think if I can answer question two or I've got something to say about question two, it's going to deal with question number one. God says, eh, doesn't work that way. If you can't answer question number one, question number two is meaningless. It doesn't matter what you've done with your time, talent, and treasure because question number one determines where you spend eternity. See, we want to be the ones who are in control. We want to be able to script our own futures. But God said, you know what? Your future is in the palm of my hand because I've created you in my image and in my likeness. So John in his epistle says it this way. He says, this is the testimony that God has given to us, eternal life. That's the there and the after in case you're wondering. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. He said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, say that with me this morning, know that you have eternal life. And what I love about this passage is, John said, I'm going to take the whole history of the Bible, the whole history of Christianity and the church, and I'm going to reduce it down to this. Real simple. So that you can't miss it. He who has the Son has life. He who doesn't have the Son doesn't have life. And I'm writing that you might know, that you know, that you know, that you know that you're part of his family. You're right with him. This was your last day on planet Earth. Heaven is your home. We call that divine assurance in theology. It's a miracle. The Holy Spirit imparts it to us. you not humanly capable of producing it. You just know. God's touched your life and it became real for you. So Paul Harvey, before he died, he was telling a story about a man, father and husband, beautiful family. Every Christmas Eve, the mother and the children go to church. Father stays home and he reads the paper. Good man, but he's just not buying this manger stuff. He's got his questions, got some doubts. He's skeptical. But he knows that something is real for his wife and his kids. So particular Christmas Eve, they go, he sits down, opens the paper. All of a sudden he hears a banging sound on the window's right next to where his special chair is, where he's reading his paper. He notices it's a bird that keeps flying into the window. And this bird is like bloodying itself, flying into the window, confused. He goes outside and tries to rescue the bird. Every time he approaches the bird, the bird flies away, runs back into the window, slowly dying. He gets so frustrated, he lashes out and calls it a stupid bird. He thinks to himself, if I can just communicate with this bird. And then the thought comes into his mind. He said, if I could just become a bird so I can communicate. And the moment that thought comes into his mind, he hears the church bells ring. And like that, it clicks. Right there, outside of that window, he's down on his knees. Gets it. He said, I'm ready. I'm ready to believe, I'm ready to surrender, I'm ready to receive that gift that you've given me, because now I understand. That bird didn't understand, and I wanted to help it, but I understand now. 
you've been reaching out to me and I'm ready to say yes. And we- Thank you for listening to this message and visiting us online today. We want you to know that all of the messages that we prepare, all of the messages that we preach are designed to give people an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ into their hearts as Lord and Savior. I know that some of you that are listening online and that listen to this message today are asking hard questions about life, hard questions about faith, hard questions about God, hard questions about life after death. You're looking for some clarity, some certainty. My prayer is that today's message and the messages that you're connecting with our online community will help to bring some clarity to your life, some direction, some strength, some hope. If God touched you during the message today and you recognize that you need more of God in your life and you want to get reconnected to Him, you want to receive the forgiveness of sins, you want to know that you know that you know that if this was your last day on planet Earth, that heaven is your home, that you're right with God, that you've got peace with Him, I want to give you an opportunity to experience that today. You say, how do you do that? You do that by praying the prayer of salvation and surrendering your heart and your life to Christ. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 that if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved. That's an incredible promise. It's a promise about God reconnecting with his sons and daughters, about us having a personal relationship with him. And I want you to know today that that promise is so powerful that God wants us to know that it's a gift that he's given to us that can't be bought, earned, or bargained for. It's a gift that can only be received. It's not automatic. It has to be personally received into our hearts. So much so that the Apostle John said, in John chapter 1 of his gospel, he said that for as many as received him, Jesus, he, the Lord, gave them the power to become the sons and the daughters of God. He gave them the right and the privilege to become the sons and the the daughters of God. It's a personal connection. It's a personal right a personal passage that happens. So I'm going to pray this prayer in just a moment and give you an opportunity to make that connection. If you want to know Him and you want to connect with Him, then just pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. On the third day, I believe you rose from the dead. I acknowledge that I need you in my life. I invite you into my heart today, Lord Jesus, to be my Lord and my Savior. I confess you today as Lord and Savior of my life. In Christ's name I pray. If you prayed that prayer today, God has set your life on a new course and a new spiritual journey has begun. It is going to be filled with adventure and hope and we believe it's going to be life-changing for you. Some important things you need to do to grow in this relationship and to begin growing in your faith. Number one, you need to get into a good local church. You can't do this by yourself. You need to be in a good Bible church where the Bible is being taught and there's a strong sense of community where you can begin to grow with other believers spiritually. You need to begin reading your Bible on a daily basis. If you don't have a Bible, just download the Bible app. If you'd like us to send you a New Testament, contact us through our website. We'll send you a New Testament and you can begin to to connect with the Bible in a personal way. Start praying on a daily basis. Let the Lord know what your needs are and some of the struggles you're going through and watch how he'll start touching your life. And then I want you to tell somebody about what you've experienced. If you're nearby, we would love to have you come and visit us on site for one of our Sunday morning celebration services. Linda and I and our staff would love the opportunity to personally meet with you and to get to know you uh, in a personal face-to-face kind of a way. And so thank you for visiting us online and listening to this message today. Stay in touch and let's stay connected.